Good afternoon. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. On behalf of today's Noon Hour program co-sponsors, which include the Global Health Club, the Holistic Medicine Club, and the Office of Multicultural Affairs, and MASAC, of course, it is an honor to introduce Mr. Bill Birdsong Miller. For years, Bill Miller's music has moved audiences around the world. He's an icon of the Native American music community, having won three Grammys in the last four years. Bill's an accomplished artist whose paintings are exhibited nationwide. Yet, in the view of singer, composer, composer flutist, painter, and storyteller, Bill Birdsong Miller, he's just getting started. Beyond music, Bill's an accomplished painter whose work has appeared in the National Museum of the American Indian Smithsonian Institution, the Barbara Abel Gallery in Santa Fe, the Trickster Gallery in Chicago, and the American Indian Community House Gallery in New York. He is also an in-demand keynote speaker and lecturer speaking at universities, race relation conferences, and cultural awareness programs nationwide. Bill Miller's passions run deep far beyond the surface of his artistic creations. Bill involves his life experiences to educate on topics such as racial, racial re reconciliation, suicide prevention, and alcohol and substance abuse prevention, and others. Today, as we honor Native American history, Bill will speak on the topic of understanding health and wellness in Native communities. As a reminder, please be sure to fill out an evaluation survey. There are some more available up front if you haven't grabbed any yet, and then pass them just to the middle as we're finished. Please help me welcome Bill Birdsong Miller to Des Moines University. That's good. It's, it's always strange to have um, somebody do a long list of intro for you when you just want to try to talk intimately, but then in a room like this, how can you be intimate? It's like... Whoa! I'm, uh, I'm used to being um, on the road, and I've been playing guitar since I've been nine years old. My first job was with my cousins in Wisconsin, who were half Indian and half Polish. And um, they had a polka band, and I played <laughs> rhythm guitar in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, in a polka band. But um, I, I would never know that eventually the Polish people would be play a big part of my healing, and I'll get to that a little bit later. What I want to do is, is, since I don't have much time with you, I wish I had more time. And if we do have time during this uh, hour, uh, I like to interact. And if you have any questions, anytime, just let me know. You know, um, I'd love to address anything of you know your concerns. Um, I'm going to give you a list of, of things that we face, uh, current problems in. in in health issues and certain issues that, uh, in Native America. And the reason I did this list was at first when I was speaking at Harvard University, um, they asked me, uh, which is strange, uh, they said, can you just not be positive when you come over here? Can you just give us the problems with Native people? I'm like, what? What is the deal with that? Why do, uh, what is it, uh, it's the other university. Notre Dame did the same thing for me. And they wanted the negatives. You know, I don't know if, you all get that, or if you're a woman and you want to speak somewhere, and they say, could you please tell us the worst things about a woman? And then, then, we'll, then we'll figure out what you're about. What's that? What's that stuff, you know? And I don't know if that's the way you've got to go into healing, if doctors diagnose from the worst to the best, but I, I still believe in human touch. I still believe in, in that type of healing, and I still believe in um, the uniqueness that we have. And that's why I want to go over this chart. Maybe I'll go over the chart first, then I'll tell you the problems we have. Over the years, I've been studying a lot of things. And um, this chart, a friend of mine from Nashville had worked it out for reconciliation, but I've added on to it. But I've got two circles up there, majority culture and minority culture, which in this room, it's great to see uh, people from both, and, and it depends what, where you're from. And uh, I was telling... Uh, the, the wonderful student who introduced me, she, I don't know, for some reason I felt she came from Minneapolis. And I just said, are you from, she said, I'm from Minnesota. And I said, oh, all right. Even though I hate the Vikings, but that's okay. I, I'm a Packer fan. No, I don't hate the Vikings. But I told her that uh, when I went to high school there that, I don't know if you know this at all, but the highest population of urban Indians is in, in the town of Minneapolis. And because that's because there are so many Indian people in Canada that come down the Dakotas, Minnesota, and Wisconsin come there to work. So there's a high population of American Indians in Minneapolis, but they face a lot of problems there. And uh, so this, this chart shows minority and majority culture. What keeps us apart is a lot of ignorance and indifference. 
to each other. Fear, resistance, pride. Um, and, and we just never seem to get together. And then what I'm, I'm amazed is college is teaching that middle word, tolerance. Uh, I get in schools and there's even histories for tolerance. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but uh, tolerance to me is where I grew up in Wisconsin is 46 below zero. Um, that's, I tolerate wind and rain. I tolerate flat tires. I tolerate whatever, losing something. But in human uh, circumstances, my relationship with you, I hope that you don't come up to me after this lecture and say, well, it was really good tolerating you for 45 minutes. You know, <laughs> you know it's just, it's just, it's, it's bogus. Uh, I received that tolerance one time. I played um, a conference, a Western Writers Conference in Cody, Wyoming. Uh, this was 16 years ago. And uh, Clint Eastwood was there and some of the best Western writers. Uh, D. Brown was there. Uh, who wrote uh, Bury My Heart, A Wounded Knee, and there were some incredible writers who I, who I met. But there were some incredible rednecks there, too. And <laughs> anyways, there were all, all the all music they had, because it was mainly Western writers are mainly white, I guess. I didn't know. I, didn't, I thought there were other people of color out there, including Hispanic and blacks. Because I know a lot of black cowboys who kick butt, and I know a lot of Indian cowboys. Cowboy is not a race. It's, it's a job. But anyways, this Western writers convention was all white. And they all had cowboy hats on, and their music was bluegrass, which I like bluegrass, but it's it's just it's just so white bread. It's like <laughs> they don't they don't move; they just sort of go faster, and they stand in one position, and just play, <laughs> you know, like that. And and I'm thinking, well, that's fun. So they asked me to sing, and I'm the only native act there, and I played my flutes and I did my stuff, and 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 they were like taken aback, you know. This was before I won Grammys, but they were like these cowboys were like mm, removing their hats. So after I got, I got done, they were afraid to clap. They were like, you know, I'm wondering what's going on. So these big cowboys come up to me and said, this is uh, Mr. Miller? I said, yes, sir. I said, you're pretty good for an Indian. What? <laughs> Thank you for that comment. Thank you so much. That's like, you know what I mean? It's just that's the tolerance bull crap. So I don't believe in tolerance. Tolerance shouldn't be part of healing. It's not part of healing. You, you either are into healing or you're not. You're into that operation room or you're not. Or get the heck out of being a doctor. You're either going to touch a human's body or you're not going to do it. You're either going to freak out and get out or you're going to commit yourself to healing. Now, you don't know the outcome of that operation, but you're sure a big part of it. And that's the same with me. I, I work a lot on a faith basis. I work a lot on a, on a sacred basis, on a point of view that this is sacred time. And nothing needs to interfere with that. And in those times, you have to Erase a lot of data. You know, you have to get out of your own trauma. You have to become a part of that situation, and it takes a lot. The other thing that we don't, that doesn't work with us in healing is assimilation. Now, um, I was up in Hayward, Wisconsin, three years ago doing a, a, a talk up there, and I was with a bunch of students, and we were out to lunch. And we were at uh, a restaurant called Norsky Nook. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's an amazing Norwegian restaurant. <laughs> now there's three of them. There's only two at the time. There's two in Wisconsin, one in Minnesota, I think. And uh, they, were, they were saying, Mr. Miller, what is assimilation? I said, assimilation? I said, assimilation is Norsky Nook becoming a Denny's. They said, you don't want another Denny's. You want another Norsky Nook. And, and you, you don't want to assimilate people into things. And I, I would hope that in your field, too, a medical field, yeah, you're, you're either going to be foot doctors or whatever or or you're going to be with children, pediatricians, or you're going to be certain things like that. Yeah, there's a, there's a genre or a label, but please don't get into the label. Don't let, this is like life too, don't let your circumstances or traumas define you. You're still who you are before you came to medical school. You're still who you are when you're in that room. You're, I'm still Bill Miller, even though I'm on stage at the Grammys. I'm still me. I'm that boy from the alcoholic home that was once nine years old, dreaming about playing guitar. I'm still him. I'm grown up, but I'm not going to lose my identity in my circumstances. Unfortunately, people do that. You've got to retain your identity even in the healing position because the people you are treating <clears throat> and the people I deal with too, even in, in a music business, they're usually traumatized. People come out to listen. They're bummed out. Oh, man, I listen to your music. I, I didn't kill myself or something. You know, and They're incredible stories, but they're going through trauma. And you've got to realize it, but there's trauma in your life too, but there has to be a balance. And when people can identify themselves and know who they are in the midst of, of war, that's when you win. You have to have focus. You can't half-ass anything. You can't just, well, I hit it. I hit. I, I got close. Did you realize that the word sin is a Greek term 
and it's an archery term. I used to be a bow hunter. Well, I grew up hunting. I'm going to get into that in a bit, taught by elders on my reservation. Sin is to miss the mark. Well, get this. If we're trying to hit the mark in archery, you want a bullseye. You don't just say, you know, you get 50 feet away. Well, it was good enough. You know, it's good enough. It's close enough. No. Hit the mark. Not only hit the mark, but go through the mark. Because that's where the kill is. That's where the, that's where the, that's where the depth is. You've got to go in the depth of things. People are so afraid to go so deep. And I urge you in your studies, I urge you in the work that you do to go deeper. Don't just glide after you get your degree. I, don't, I didn't glide. I've been working my butt off since I've been nine. I'm in my 50s now, and I just won three Grammys. Life is not over yet for me. But I'm not gliding. As soon as I won the Grammys, I didn't say, oh, here I go, man. I'm in a Lexus now. Oh, ha, ha, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm rocking now. Well, if, if that be the case, guess what? The Lexus trumps me. No, you got to trump everything you do. you got to be that person. you got to be on top of things. you got to take control so when people get in your presence, they're with a badass. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> they're, they're in the presence of somebody who believes and does what they do. That's who I want to go to war with. That's who, if I was a doctor, that's who I'd want to be in surgery with. Somebody who believes and says what they're going to do. Not somebody who comes in, so how are you feeling? Oh, I don't know. I don't know about this, you know. Well, you want to do this? Well, I'm thinking about it. Well, maybe. Why don't you go ahead and do it? I think I'm going to go golfing. I don't know. I can't handle this. You want to be in a room with somebody like that? I wouldn't. When I get on stage, I get on stage with people who are confident, who when they grab the instrument, whether it be this flute or my guitar, that I'm a part of that instrument. And that's what you're doing when you pick up what you're doing. Your instruments are not only of healing, but they're of peace. They're of power. They're a point where this nation needs to see with all this health care issues going on, that you guys are extremely more important than insurance companies. To me, you are. Insurance companies are whatever they are, but you're the healers. And that's a powerful title when I walk up to a medical field. It has to be taken seriously. Same with teachers. They're teachers. Why is this country overlooking the fact of the healers? It's powerful. We need you. But you need to understand we're all unique, as unique as you are. On Indian reservations, like, like I said, the, the, the best way to heal for me, and I'll get to that later, is through reconciliation. Now, reconciliation comes in many forms, and reconciliation can't be forced. But healing comes through reconciling. Now, let's say you're with a patient, an Indian people, and, and I just want you to understand I'm going to bring up some problems and things going on, but I, I don't know how you'd reconcile in an operating room, but you do have to reconcile with yourself when you're going through things because everything is affected. Now, when I, when I sing a song, sometimes I'll sing to a crowd... And I'll see somebody later when I'm signing a CD that reminds me of my dad. Or some, something will click in. And, and it's good and bad in some ways. But we've got to remain on top of things. We have to rise above the storm. And, you know, you guys are going to be, I see students in here, someday you're going to be in a, a high, high-pressure situation. And you're going to be there many times. And, and someday, you're going to, if, if not already, you're going to face storms that you didn't realize that could come to you. Because sometimes, like when you're at the Grammys, you think, oh, man, it's all great. Nothing, nothing bad's going to happen. As soon as you leave, you know, I was in a five-star hotel in Beverly Hills. The next week, I was just in a Super 8 somewhere else in Iowa doing a gig, you know. It, it, was, it was like boom, 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 boom. That's the way it is. But in, in the world we're in, I want you to understand that I've seen things that are miraculous, miraculous healings. I've seen things that can take us to the top of what we do. And, and they're outside of the school. They're off the map. The best musicians have taken their music and taken it off the grid. And you're going to have to do that with healing. There's going to be times when no Zoloft, no Paxil is going to do anything anymore. It's going to be you encouraging a patient. It's going to be you encouraging somebody. It's going to be you that's going to be part of the healing. Isn't that the great thing to think you not only were physically there, but you're spiritually there? Spirit matters. Your spirit matters. So one time I was in Montana, I was, I was working on a PBS film for the state of Montana, and we were in Glacier Park, and we watched a storm come in. And this storm with 60-mile-an-hour winds was blowing birds everywhere. And this friend of mine was an ornithologist. And he said, did you see all those birds getting blown out? I said, yeah. He says, did you see any eagles in there? I said, no. He said, were you going to see what an eagle does when a 60-mile-an-hour wind comes? I said, that'd be cool. We waited 45 minutes, and sure enough, there were two <clears throat> pair of golden eagles that were going through this canyon. And then the wind kicked, and he says, now watch a golden eagle. Now, I don't know if you know about eagles, but golden eagles are totally different. They're the same family, but they're different than a bald eagle. You'll see bald eagles around here and stuff in Minnesota and Wisconsin. For one thing, golden eagles are very solitary. 
and they, they mate for life, and they, they don't hunt in big groups. They're just together. The other thing is a female golden eagle is ten foot, has a 10-foot wingspan. Huge birds. Well, anyways, the golden eagles were floating above there, and I watched them, and that 60-mile-an-hour wind came in. And instead of getting kicked back 60 miles an hour, what they did was they turned immediately to face the storm. And not only did they turn, they locked their wings. And when they locked their wings, they rose above the storm. They went straight up. You can see it on YouTube. I, a friend said, oh, I can't believe this. I said, look it up on YouTube. Look up Golden Eagles, man. Everything's on YouTube. <laughs> One day I'll be watching a doctor going, well, Mr. Miller, I think you well, Let me check YouTube on this. <laughs> it's incredible. And do we do that enough? I don't think so. A lot of times, uh, the first choice we have that we think in our gut is, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. You know, No. It isn't I'm out of here. You guys have made it this far. You've got a, you got a ways to go, and, and the best is ahead of you, but I'd, I'd suggest you start locking your wings and start facing your storms. Because guess what? That's where, that's where it's at. You know, I had to lock my wings. I had a lot of people tell me, you ain't going to make it, Indian. You ain't going to get through. Yeah, no, 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 no. Bull crap. I'm being offered a, a reality television show right now. I hope it comes through. We'll see what happens. There's no Indians on TV right now. Where the heck are we? You know? We're following Lone Ranger somewhere. You know? I don't want to do that. I'm not going to be some guy, Lone Ranger's sidekick. No way. <laughs> but anyways, let me give you the problems. One of the main problems we have is isolation. And... Um, to me, isolation is bad. Isolation in our own lives is bad. You know, when you isolate yourself and you're depressed, that becomes suicidal. And what we should do is isolate those problems, like you do in the medical field. You should isolate things when you're doing a look at things. You're, you're seeing things. You isolate things to find out where the tumor is. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of emotional tumors in, in a lot of us. But isolation is there. No electricity, no phone connections, bad Internet, bad job conditions. Unemployment rate is 50 to 70%. We have the lowest average of income in the United States. We have a lot of uh, environmental destruction. Even though you don't have casinos, I tell people I was born in the B.C. period before casinos. <laughs> a lot of the, the tribal people, we don't get that money. There's a, there's a tribe in Minnesota that's getting some kick butt, but other than that, everybody else is not getting it. We have environmental destruction all around us, uh, lack of good education, poverty, social challenges, uh, shortage, shortage, shortage of housing, good housing. We have a lot of health issues uh, concerning uh, that, that make our kids drop out of school. Is school high school dropouts are 54%. You have the highest rate of uh, infant mortality in the United States. Highest rate of suicide. Highest teen rate of suicide. 18.5 per 100,000 people are killing themselves. Highest teen pregnancy. Lowest life expectancy. I made it past. 55 years. Can you believe that? What is that about? We have drugs, alcohol, domestic violence, crimes, or rape and child abuse. And President Kennedy said it well. Um, he said, for a subject worked and reworked so often in novels, motion pictures, and television, American Indians remain probably the least understood and most misunderstood Americans of us all. It's incredible. I was with uh, an American Indian group at another university in Wisconsin just yesterday, and, and I met with some leaders. And a lot of crime and domestic violence and, and the abuse that happens on reservations never gets reported. You never see it on CNN, murders. You just don't see it because it's not important, at least to the nation. Um, population of Native Americans, when I did this research, it was 2.5 million. That means there are more Mexican Americans in Los Angeles than there are American Indians in the United States. Can you believe that? But it's up now. It's at 5.2 million. There are 1.3 million Indians in Canada. There are 562 federally recognized tribes. And uh, what do you think the state with the most, the most tribes, most tribes in? What would you, can anybody take a guess? Oklahoma, Oklahoma? you're close. No, not. What was that? No. This is going to surprise you. It's California. They have more tribes than any other state in the United States. It doesn't mean their population is up. It's just small tribes in California. The other two states are ones that you recognize was Oklahoma and Arizona. Those are the two most populated states of the American Indians, both at 250,000 population. 20% uh, of American Indians still live on the reservations, and uh, only 14%, uh, which is small, still speak their traditional language. We have a lot of mental health issues. Um, 
I was going through stuff, depression about my father, uh, about when he died in 1993, and about five years later, I went through an incredible healing, and I went to my tribe, and I, I, I just, I think we all have to be honest with each other, and, and you're in a healing uh, situation being doctors, but you need to take care of yourselves. You understand what I'm saying? You know, you're going to be, you're going to get to a point where you're going to take care of everybody else, but forget yourselves. Don't forget about yourself. Every once in a while, I urge you to go to five bucks, I mean Starbucks, <laughs> and, um, and just relax and heal on yourself because uh, you're going to get sucked dry by your job and by people. You're going to, you're going to be, you're going to be pushed hard and you have to stay strong. I know I do. So anyways, I went to my tribe and I said, I got some mental health. I'm, I'm getting so depressed. I can't, I can't write songs. I can't tour. And they said, do you know we have $2,700 per uh, tribal member for health care? I go, what? For, for, for these things, for mental health? They said, yeah. And they said, nobody picks it up because everybody claims to be perfect. I said, wow. Well, I'm not. You know, so I went in and, and it was the best thing I could. I went to Minneapolis and I ended up forgiving my father. I went through a lot of powerful things. So mental health issues are ignored by our own people, too. That's what I'm saying. You're, when you deal with Indian people, they're, they're pretty much in, in denial about their problems. They, they Sometimes they don't. They lock up. They aren't going to share them with you. So you've got to be careful. You've got to be very sensitive about this. The other thing that people don't realize are problems is discord between other tribes. Tribes are like the Hatfields and McCoys. I'm telling you that. In Wisconsin, there's three tribes fighting against another tribe. There's, there's, there's still tribal differences. We're all quite different, you know? In Montana, in Billings, where I've played before, uh, the Crow and the Cheyenne, you can see them physically. <clears throat> They're quite different looking. The Cheyenne are real tall and dark skinned. The Crow look quite different too. But usually you're, you're only going to find alcoholic crows in, in the city of Billings, Montana. You're not going to find Cheyenne. They're, they're too proud. They won't do it. And they, they, they hate each other for it. They don't like to get together. So there's discord between tribes. And then there's the continuing broken relationship between American Indians and the United States. Um, and I hope that through the arts and through healing that we can, we can start to bring things together because it, it's all about healing. You know, to me, life is a continual healing cycle. So I'm, I'm proud of you guys for making it this far in your careers, in your life, and, and I, I want to encourage you uh, that, that what I do is healing too. I mean, I, I'm a musician, but I believe further than that. It's, it's like therapy. It, it heals me. It's brought me through some severe life Issues. Let me play a little piece here, and I'm going to tell you stories. I got plenty of time. See if you recognize this piece. You probably won't, but when I tell you, you you'll get it. If you didn't recognize that, a woman named Vanessa Williams sang that. She won an Academy Award. It's called Colors of the Wind. That was me playing the flute on a soundtrack for Walt Disney's uh, Pocahontas. Sound went out. Is the sound on or check? It is. The screen went off on me. I don't know. Um, yeah, I got that opportunity one night. Walt Disney Productions called me. This is where it pays to be real. <laughs> and uh, they had a synthesizer track pretending to be an Indian flute. And one guy said, that is not going to work. And, uh, so they were in Nashville, so they called an Indian. You know, they, they, they literally said, are you the real thing? Are you, a, are you Bill Miller? I said, yeah. Can you come in at 10 in the morning and work on this film? I said, yeah, I didn't even know what it was, but I went and did it, and uh, it was an amazing project, and uh, it opened up a lot of doors for me. But um, this, this instrument here, I, I, uh, I believe in it. Yeah, I've been playing it ever since I've been a a young kid, and then eventually it became part of an industry. And um, it's, an, it's an instrument of, um, of peace. That's what it is. It, it brings peace to my heart. It brings healing to me. This, um, this instrument's been on several soundtracks, too. Um, I get these odd calls from publishers and movie people. And uh, a few years back, I get this odd call from, I think it was HBO or Showtime. They said, can we put um, your song, uh, Approaching Thunder, in the last episode of one of our most popular things on television, I said, sure. And, you know, it was a nice $24,000 check immediately, and they still paid me royalties. I said, yeah, go ahead. I didn't know what it was. It was Sex in the City. <laughs> like, 
So, I'm in the last episode of Sex in the City <laughs> in a hot tub scene playing a flute thing. <laughs> Healing comes in all forms. <laughs> yeah. This flute, though, uh, it, it means a lot to me because it's, it's one side, if you can see it as a tool, it's got no holes on it. That's the drone side. It has just one note. I can't change the note. Now, if I play this side, if six holes open, it gets the octave, the higher octave. And even if I cover up the six holes and blow too hard, it still gets the higher octave. So the way to imitate the other side is to close the holes and just take it easy, Bill. Take it easy. Just don't blow too hard. And if you don't blow hard, you just breathe. Guess what? You get that note. It's incredible that to be able to uh, imitate that. I wonder... If I could get this thing back on so I can turn up the... I'm sorry to bother you. But anyways, I want to show you what happens when the two of these notes come together. Uh, and there's two holes on the back. You can't see. You're so darn far away. But I have to play both at the same time. It takes a lot of wind control. And it just takes... Sometimes when I played this in Colorado, it takes the guts right out of you because you're at a higher altitude. Oh, thank you so much. I'm sorry to bother you. It's on film, so no big deal. <laughs> Um, when I was much younger, when I was 16, I remember being uh, in a, not in a class or a school, but it was under the tutelage, uh, tutoring of uh, elders, and these guys were expert master deer hunters, and they made handmade bows out of the native woods in Wisconsin, and it was beautiful, and, uh, but interesting, I went through three different parts of, of learning, and I want to share this with you because people ask me how I, how I keep winning at, at whatever I keep doing, and, and it, 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 takes, it takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of forward movement, but it also these three elements are what I use, and I know they're going to help you, and, they, and you I, I actually do them, but I'm going to just bring them down in three letters, and, and that's O-I-A, observation, interpretation, application. In the observation stage, when I was younger, um, these men said, you know what? They told uh, three or four of us we were learning hunt. They said, you guys... Uh, Need to observe what we're doing. Need to watch us because we're gonna we're gonna be hunters. We're gonna hunt deer. But um, I don't want you to say anything. And we go what? No, don't speak up. Just shut up. You know, basically just be quiet and watch and take in everything you can because this is a period where you want you to be quiet. And so that was the best learning experience I've ever had. Truly, where you know you don't go to a classical concert and listen to a viola player or violinist and you're talking during the whole thing. You're totally silent. You, you, and, and I would imagine, you know, during some of the most intense brain surgery, you're not going to be like that commercial you're talking and talking about your next trip or something, but there's a lot of intensity going on. And uh, same with learning. I think if we shut down our whatever part of our brain and open up the other side, it, it retains, it, it learns, it learns better. So observing, observation is an intense skill that we need to hone. Um, observation has taken me so many places. So after... So many weeks of observing these guys, the way they dressed, the way they, they, they took the bow, the way they hit things, the way they practiced, the, how they tracked, everything. It was in my mind. Then they go, now is the interpretation stage. And I said, well, what's that? They said, now you can actually ask us questions. I go, wow, cool. But they said, only once. And I go, what? And they said, yeah, just don't ask me seven times. Ask me once, think about it before you ask me, and ask me the question. That was another great learning process. So... We would think as kids, like, what am I going to ask this guy? Because I can't ask a stupid question because he won't take it again. So we would ask him some pretty wise things. It makes you even better because I was interpreting what I observed. So I would ask about, well, why did you do this? And why did this happen? And they would just be totally transparent and honest. That's the way it should be between student and teacher. The last part was application. I'll never forget it because I got my bow, this beautiful big handmade bow, and uh, to this day, I've never shot a compound bow in my life. I've, I've always shot these handmade bows. 
and I hope to shoot a compound bow someday. But anyways, I went out in the field, and it was winter, uh, early winter. I had my arrows, and I was tracking this white-tailed buck for four or five miles. And uh, I went through this swamp area, and I was on my hands and knees, it was, and my heart was beating. I was like, if you've ever deer hunted, it's like borderline heart attack, you know, it's just like your heart's going boom, boom, boom. And uh, I saw the white patch of its, its tail, and I thought, well, I'm getting close enough. And, and the tracks were so fresh, there was smoke coming off of them. And I get to this field, it was an open field where he had a cross, and there's some bushes there, but pretty much could get an open shot. And I get out in the open, I go, whoa, where's the deer? And there was no deer. And I, I look at the tracks, and they ended up in the middle of this little field with nothing like a UFO must have picked it up, you know. I'm like, where'd this thing go? There's no deer. There's just a stop of the tracks. And I'm watching, I'm looking around. All of a sudden, boom, big buck snort behind me. And at the time, my bow and arrows were boom, you know, and they fly to my hands, and I'm, I'm arrowless, bowless. And, uh, and this deer was right behind me. And, I, and then he ran off. Not ran, he walked off like you idiot, you know. And, <laughs> and um, so I picked up my bow and arrows, and I, I, I went back to the tracks again, and I realized, wait a minute, this thing doubled back. When it was, he has doubled his tracks, he backed up in his own tracks, then he jumped sideways, and he came around me because I was tracking him. That's a deer. Are we that smart? Not really. We have, to, we have to go back. We can be. We have to go back. So think about <clears throat> what you're observing. How are you interpreting it? And how are you applying yourself? Think about yesterday. You know, what did you look at yesterday? What did you really look at? Were you just looking at your assignments? Or were you looking at, at, at excellence? Were you looking at mediocrity? Were you looking at beauty? Were you looking at death? Were you looking at anxiety? Were you looking at, what, what were you looking at? And how did you interpret it? And then how are you applying it? You know, think about it. Some people that, where I grew up in an alcoholic home, nine kids, my dad beating the hell out of my mom, breaking her jaw twice. And, um, you know, the crap that went on. He abused my sisters, and I hated him. That's when I talked talk about healing. Uh, after he died, I had to take years and years to heal, to forgive and, and move on in my life. But that stuff affects the way we are as healers. You know, if you think you're going to be a healer, that's great. I, I, I meet a lot of people. Even my sister's a doctor, actually. I have a sister who's a doctor. And she got it because she was so abused by my father. And she, she's going to make it happen and stuff. But that's great. But in some ways, I'm, I'm more healing to her than she owes me thousands of dollars in counseling money. I mean, I'm on the phone with her all the time, like helping her out. And uh, you can't be an unhealed doctor. You've got to be healed yourself. You, and, and it may take you the rest of your life. But I'm just saying... Be certain you're on that healing path because it's, it's going to affect the way you do things. And you've got to reconcile. So what are you observing? You know, so make sure you're looking at the best. That's all i got to say. Now, I, I told some people if I won the Grammy, what if I watched this, this goofy guy? Uh, I don't know who he is, but I mean, let's, let's say I spent my years, past 25 years, going to a Ramada Inn in Madison, Wisconsin, watching a, a, an old fart playing Billy Joel tunes to a bunch of drunks. And that was my limit of learning. Where the heck would I be? I wouldn't be at the Grammys. No. In fact, no. I hung out. I toured with Pearl Jam. I toured with Tori Amos. I toured with people that, that are superstars. I hung out with Eric Clapton. I hang out with the best people in the world. Because that's where the magic is. You aren't going to find it in the low end. But you're going to be called to the low end. You might be healing somebody on a farm. You might be dealing with somebody who's totally broke or homeless. You might be dealing with the most richest person in Iowa. I don't know. But if that doesn't matter. What matters is you, where you're at. Are you able to go from the high to the low? Some people aren't. I can. It doesn't matter to me. We don't have a sound system here. I'm going through a lectern mic. And, and I, I'd be playing in the inner city or on a reservation if I had to. You've got to be able to pull yourself back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You can't just stay. well, I'm here now, damn it, and I'm only going to heal these people. And I'm this and I'm that. No, no, you're, you're still Bill Miller, you know. You happen to have three Grammys, but that's not who you are. And, and who I am is powerful and healed. It all started, and <clears throat> I have time to tell this one story before I start playing some songs. But when I went to college, um, I ended up um, being blessed with a degree, an uh, honorary degree, recently from University of Wisconsin La Crosse, the second given in 110 years, I guess. But I, I quit school when I was a junior because I was so frustrated with college. I went to Layton School of Art and Design and Milwaukee School of the Arts, and then UWL. But I just got frustrated. And in fact, my professors told me to quit, if you can believe that. They said, 
They said, you know, you need to get out. You, you can make it in the music industry. And the guy was right. I made it. But I felt bad. Uh, and But I did. I, I went on to, to get myself ahead in life. And, and I'm very thankful. But I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't have been ahead if it weren't, weren't for this incident. And this is the incident. It's an incredible story. Of um, it's, it's funny, too. But um, When I left the reservation, it was... Uh, it was 1973, and um, I, I couldn't wait to leave my dad. You know, I, I, I couldn't stand seeing <clears throat> what I was going through. I was the oldest of nine kids, and I was like, um, I was on an Indian boxing team too. And I, me and my brother, we were all Golden Glove boxing champs. And my my dad was a three-time Wisconsin champion. He was also European boxing champion in the U.S. Army, and he he was a tough dude. But you know, I, I couldn't handle how he was abusing us, so. When I got a chance to go to college, I went, I went crazy. I went to Layton School of Art and Design, and um, it was an awesome art school. And I got, I got a little place in the inner cities of Milwaukee, and I didn't have much money. And uh, I walked about a mile and a half to school. And I remember exactly what I was wearing the first day of uh, registration for class. I was wearing a Levi jacket, had a white T-shirt on. Uh, I had cowboy boots on because I ride horses all the time, and, and I had blue jeans on. And I had a tackle box, which... I used to fish with, but I put my pencils and my art supplies in there, along with my daredevils and my fishing stuff were still in there. And I'm carrying it to school, <clears throat> and I go to art school. Now, this is a medical school. It looks like a medical school. It just does. I mean, you guys don't look like medics, but it's like, it's a school. But you ever go to art school? Art school is bohemians from hell. It's, <laughs> it's, you go there, and there were no people of color there at all. No Hispanics, no, no Asians, no American Indians. It was all really upper crossed white kids, but these weren't the typical upper... These, they all wore berets and had goatees, you know, even the girls. You know. <laughs> but they were all talking about Manet, Monet, and Dagon, and they're all, like, leaning sideways, and they have their portfolios, and, you know, they just, they just look good. They just look cool. None of them are like... They're, they just look, yes, and do you know that the Dagon... That, they're talking Picasso and stuff, and I'm standing in line like, huh? And... Levi jacket, tackle box. I looked like a trout fishing guide from Canada. You know, I was like, "Hi, can you go trout fishing with me?" Yes. And nobody was talking to me, and I was traumatized. I'm feeling pretty nerdy, and there's this other nerd kid in front of me, and he kept checking me out, kind of making me nervous. <clears throat> and he turns around, and he says, uh, "Can I ask you a question?" I said, "Sure." Uh, are you Indian or something? <laughs> and back then, I had really long hair and everything, and I was like, really skinny kid, and I said, uh, and I, I was, it was stupid, I was such a nerd, I was ashamed, I was like, yes, I'm sorry, I'm an Indian, I meant it, I was sorry that I was an Indian, because it was, again, the B.C. period, before Costner, it wasn't cool, there was no dances with wolves out, it wasn't like, <laughs> so I said, yeah, I'm an Indian, I'm sorry, he said, well, pleased to meet you, he puts his hand out, pleased to meet you, I'm a Polak, I go, whoa, that's awesome, you know. And he proceeded to tell me the worst Polak jokes I've ever heard in my life. I'm like, dude, please don't tell me. No, no you heard the one about the Polaks. And we're laughing. And all these artsy, fartsy type are looking at me and Dave. His name is Dave. Like we were mentally ill, you know, like, what's just the problem with these two? And uh, we just kept laughing and laughing. We went in and registered for drawing classes, figure drawing and design class and got our classes. We had a great day. It was Friday. <clears throat> Get done with school. And Dave goes, he goes, uh, so what are you doing this weekend, Bill? He says, are, are you going back to the res? I said, nah, not really. I don't have enough gas money, and it's a it's a 200-mile ride. I said, nah, I'm just going to stay in my apartment. He said, how would you like to stay with us this weekend, come to the Polish side of town, and just spend the weekend with, with the Polish family? I said, that rocks. I said, yeah, I'll do it. So he said, well, stay out front of the school. My car is parked in back in the lot. He says, you'll know I'm coming. I got a, I got a new car. My dad bought it for my graduation. And um, <clears throat> from high school, he said, it's got thrush mufflers on, and you'll hear it. It's a loud car. I said, okay, man. It's the 70s, you know. All of a sudden, here's this, this muscle car pulls around, man. It's a 69 Chevelle Super Sport with a 327 Hurst shifter in it and, you know, big mag tires. And the thing is shaking, man. You know, those cars that are real cars. It wasn't a Kia, you know what I mean? It was, it was a freaking Chevy. And, and there were no automatic seatbelts, no FM radio. It was just a muscle car. And I'm like, this rocks. I said, you Polacks rock. And I, I, got, in, I got in the car, you know, and, and didn't even put the seatbelt on. And we hit the highway. We're going 70, 85 miles an hour immediately. No cops after us. It was like the 70s. It was like, yeah. We're listening to Creedence Clearwater Revival and Marvin Gaye. And it's like, yes, this rocks. 
And we get to the Polish side of town, and life is good, and I'm thinking, man, this is beautiful. And we pull in this house, and there's smoke coming out of the window and stuff, and I could smell sausages as aunt was cooking. And I said, man, it's a lot like the rest, because ten people live in the same house, and uh, all his relatives and stuff. And we walk in, and they look at me like... They didn't, but the deal was they didn't look at me like an alien, like I'd get all the time at major airports in the United States. <clears throat> they, they just said, hey, how are you doing there? You know, this Wisconsin typical, <laughs> how are you guys doing there? <laughs> I'm doing good. And uh, his aunt says, uh, well, who's this? And Dave said, well, this is my friend Bill Miller. I met him at the college. Oh, come on in there, Bill. He says, you guys get ready for dinner. Be ready here in about 20 minutes. So we go upstairs, and Dave gets up there, and he immediately undresses and he puts on this purple shirt with his name emblazoned. I'm like, what is that? You know, you get dressed for dinner, you know, at your own house. He goes, no, no. He says, <clears throat> he says, excuse me. He said, I'm, I'm in a Polish bowling league, and we're going bowling after dinner. I go, what? <laughs> because I never been bowling in my life. I grew up on an Indian reservation. We don't say to each other, hey chief, you want to go bowling tonight? Yeah, man. <laughs> Let's go. We just never. It never came into our. Our talk, we don't ask to go bowling. We went trout fishing, deer hunting, or whatever. So, so I went bowling with him, and Dave had this custom ball, and he's one of those bowlers that throws the ball down right on the side. looks like it's going into the gutter, but it gets a strike, and he was great. We had a great time. Friday night, we got home about midnight. Had the best night sleep I'd had ever, you know, because usually Friday nights, my dad was drunk, and he'd come home Saturday or Sunday, late Saturday night into Sunday, we'd be fighting, you know. So I thought, wow, man, I had a great sleep. I woke up, and um, Dave says, so you ready for today? I said, yeah, what's going on today? He goes, we're going to a Polish wedding reception. I go, really? Okay. Man, I tell you what, that rocked. <clears throat> they had so much food and so much alcohol there. I've never seen people drink and eat so much and be happy. So, you know, because where I'm from, if you put that much alcohol in front of a bunch of Indians, it'd be Jerry Springer show. It'd be, we'd be killing each other. <laughs> Seriously, like, oh, yeah, yeah, get on, you know. There'd be fights and stabbings and brutality going on and ex-wives killing ex-husbands in the parking lot with their truck. But the Polish people, they just kept happy. They had a polka band. They were singing, in heaven there is no beer. That's why we drink it here. When we're gone from here, boom, 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 our friends will be drinking all the beer. And it was like they were doing that. And, and it's like, wow, these are the happiest white people I've ever seen in my life. And they were just getting off, and so we went back home, and nobody got hurt, and nobody was overly drunk, and a Sunday morning came, <laughs> and Dave's shaking me like in the bed, like, Bill, wake up, wake up. I go, what? What's the matter, man? He goes, are you okay? And I go, yeah, I'm fine. He says, do you know what you were doing? I go, no, what was I doing? He says, you were crying, and you were gritting your teeth, and you were punching the wall and saying, stay away from her. I go, oh. He goes, what was that about? I go, nothing, nothing. <clears throat> and and I, I was just in shock myself. Didn't want to tell Dave. I'd, I, it was the first weekend away from my father, my alcoholic, abusive father. And I thought, well, okay, no problem. And immediately, you got to use this too in your healing as aromatherapy because uh, I smelled breakfast. It made me get out of my trauma. <laughs> it's like the smell of bacon. Maybe you should bring them in the operation room. Bacon. <laughs> Make some eggs, bacon stuff. and Oh. <gasps> popcorn, whatever, you know. But it, it just, it took me out of my trauma. And I went downstairs, and, and his mom was cooking, and his dad was down there, and we started eating breakfast. And I started noticing the differences between us, you know, because there are differences. Me and Dr. Salas talked about that, 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 that in healing, you're going to limit your healing if you don't recognize the differences in the people you heal. And you've you got, you got to realize this is a beautiful thing, to be different, because you're unique too. So I started looking at Dave's dad, and he was the opposite of my father. My father was... He's a big dude, man. He was tattooed, Korean War veteran, boxing champion, all-state hockey player, all-state football player. He looked like an Indian Elvis Presley with tattoos. He was a good-looking guy, but he was mean, mean. And he didn't say much. And he walked like a man, you know, just a man. That's just the way, I guess, the men walk. My dad walked like a guy. Mr. Zwifka, you know, my dad was dark-skinned, black hair and everything. Mr. Zwifka was pink, you know. And he was cute. He was like, like a little doll. He wanted to hug him because he was so cute. And um, he didn't walk like a man. He walked like a penguin. You know what I mean? <laughs> he had his little bedroom slippers on. And he's very Polish. And he walked in the kitchen by us. And he comes up to Dave. And he goes, he goes, hey, Davey. He says, uh, what are you and Bill doing after breakfast here? And uh, 
Dave says, well, we're going to go out to Lake Michigan and go throw the Frisbee around. He goes, well, before you go, Derry, he says, uh, I need to talk some serious issues with you. Uh, just only take a few minutes, Dave, but I need to talk to you before you go out of the house. I'm sorry to bother you and Bill. No problem, Dad. So he leaves. He goes into the living room. And uh, Dave says to me, he says, Bill, can I, can I go uh, talk to my dad before we go? You know, don't worry about it. And I said, yeah, no problem. So Dave's dad, <clears throat> he left, and I was uh, kind of freaking out because um, I thought, well, maybe um, maybe something's going to happen to Dave. I wonder if Polish dads beat their sons like up on the reservation. I wonder if they demean them and tell them they're not men and, and all the things I went through. So I followed him down the hall. Dave didn't know him. My friend didn't know I didn't tell him for 15 years that I, I saw what your dad did to you. But... Uh, I went down there and I stood on the side and I was in the dark, you know, watching his dad. And there was a big rocking chair in there. I don't know if you ever seen the movie Elf, but it was like Elf, you know, where the son sits on dad's lap, you know. It's like they're rocking like this. And it was cool. Dave's a big kid and his dad's a little Polish guy. And uh, they're smiling. All of a sudden, Dave's dad stops rocking. He says, uh, he says, Davey, I want to tell you a couple of things here. And, uh, okay, dad, what's up? He says, did you know you're the first one in our family to ever go to college? Uh, all of us are like, we, I work at Pabst Brewery. We all do machine work and stuff. We're in the factories. We don't go to college. He says, you're the first one. He says, I just want to know how it went. And Dave said, it went good, Dad. It was a great day, and I met Bill, and I'm, I'm going to do good, Dad. He says, well, I'm proud of you, Dave. I'm really proud of you. And they rocked again. They smiled. And Dave said, what else, Dad? He goes, oh, just one more thing before you go. And uh, Dave said, well, what's that? And he just, they looked at each other. And he says, uh, I love you. I love you very much, Dave. And Dave said, uh, love you too, Dad. And he smiled. And he says, come here, son. And he pulled his son in and he, and he kissed him on the cheek and they just held each other, which to me seemed like eternity, man. Like, what the hell? His dad kissed him. His dad looked in his eyes for an extended period of time. His dad loves him. What, what, what's the matter with me? Um, that moment will never leave. I don't know why it happened, that, but it happened at that moment in my life. I couldn't accept it for many years. I think some of us are so traumatized we don't think that we deserve uh, what other people have. That's bullcrap. We deserve the best. You deserve the best. So do I. I'm not going to be turned away by my race, my color, my, any of my... I'm just going to keep walking that same path. That moment showed me there are men that can love their wives. There are men that can love their sons and daughters. There are men that can do that. And that's healing to me. That's strength. That's focus. That's power. That's powerful. And if you can see that, you're going to change the world. If you can look into somebody's eyes, no matter how sick they are, or in their last day on this earth, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Bring dignity into the room, okay? Bring dignity in the last moments. Bring dignity. That's all that matters. Really, in, in, the, in the moments that we're in healing, and think of it your own self. You don't need a lecture. He just said a couple words. He just met the person's eyes. When people look at me, it means, it means the world to me. When people are honest with me, it means the world to me. I'm sick of the BS in the world. Just tell me what's up. You know, you ever get in a meeting and somebody's looking at your earlobe or your cheekbone instead of looking at you in the eye like, hey, Bill, how are you doing? Man? Excuse me, look right here. <laughs> you know. So to me, that's incredibly healing. And... Um, I'm going to try to do one song for you before, uh, if we have some questions. But uh, this song I'm going to do is um, an intense song of emotions. And it's not mine. The reason I'm going to do it is because I was asked to do it at a festival one time. And I said, I don't know the lyrics. And they said, well, we got an iPhone. I go, oh, no. <laughs> I said, here's the lyrics. I said, well, I don't know the melody. Well, here, oh, here's the video of the guy doing it. So I had to learn it. And isn't it crazy that in our lives we're so connected to things that are meant to be if we just would go in that spirit? And um, so it ended up, I realized that this song, I knew the guy who made it a hit because I was on a TV show with him. 
And uh, I, I knew the guy that wrote it. I was at the Grammys with him. The guy that wrote it is Leonard Cohen. I sat next to him at a Lifetime Achievement Award, one of the best songwriters in the world. He and Bob Dylan. And then I, I was on a TV show with the guy who made the song famous. His name is Jeff Buckley. And Jeff and I met, and only two years later, Jeff died. But I met one of the most incredible talents who was probably analyzed as ADD, but he was a genius. So I'm going to sing this song for you. I'd like to thank Dr. Salas, too, for bringing me here. It just was a last-minute thing. I hope you enjoyed it. I, I did. And now you got to see what I do. This is the way I heal. And when I heal, I have to go into a zone. I, I'd encourage you, before you take that, that operating tool or something, I, I do it with the guitar in my band, even, even at the Grammys. I... Wait until my heartbeat is right. Wait till I'm breathing correctly. Whew. You know, I get myself centered, and then I tell my band, let's go. Let's roll. Then it starts up. I wonder if I can turn that, that thing up a bit. Is that okay? Can you turn it up for me? On the, on the back? a secret chord David played and it pleased the Lord but you don't really care for music that much do you well it goes like this the fourth the fifth the minor fall the major lift the baffled king composing hallelujah hallelujah Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, your faith was strong, but you knew. You saw her bathing on the roof, and her beauty and the moonlight overthrew you. You to her kitchen and she she broke your throne, she cut your hair, and from your lips she drew the Hallelujah. 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 I've seen this room and I've walked this floor. You know I used to live alone before I knew you. I've seen your flag on the marble arch. You know love is not a victory march. It's a cold. It's a broken hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Yeah. yeah, there was a time when you let me know what was really going on below, but you never showed it to me anymore, do you? Remember when I moved in you? Holy dove was moving to every breath we drew was a hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. hallelujah. 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 Maybe there. 
got a buzz. All I've ever learned from love was how to shoot somebody who outdrew you. It's not a cry that you hear at night. No, it's not somebody who just seen the light. It's a call. It's a lonely hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you so much. I don't have much time. I know you have to leave. And I uh, sure appreciate being here. i um, driven through Iowa many times and played here, but uh, I hope I, I felt a lot of connection today. I, I'm a very spirit-led person, and I felt a lot of connection here. I just hope you continue to go on your pathway to healing in a, in a, in a good way, in a beautiful way, and we're going to see a lot of a lot of great healing in our lives. I mean, that's that you have a powerful position, to me, one of the most powerful positions in, in our lifetime, to be on this earth, to be a part of somebody's healing. Uh, it's a great thing. I, I congratulate you on that. Are there any questions at all before I leave your town and head to another gig? Uh, answer anything you want. It doesn't have to be about Native people. It can be about music or whatever. Questions? Yes. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Well, uh, let, let's all leave with being examples to each other and, and again, uh, observe excellence today, all right? Uh, and, and when you get time, and I know you guys are busy studying and I don't know, probably for tests or whatever you're going through, but... Um, I can tell you this, the tests never end. <laughs> the finals are out there in the real world, and you're going to be facing a lot of things. I encourage you to look at the starlight once in a while, to uh, look in the clouds, to feel the wind on your face, and to uh, see the reality that is there. That, that um, it, it'll, it'll keep you balanced. Don't, don't go into this, uh, this incredible profession you have ahead of you <clears throat> not, not balanced. And, and I'm sure you are, but I'm just saying keep balance. It's a daily thing. It's a discipline to be a warrior. And I consider you all uh, warriors in what you're doing. I don't consider it just a normal job. It's, it's beyond normal. I mean, it's just unbelievable what you're doing. I encourage you as uh, another healer. I'm, I'm not a doctor, but I, I am a healer just like you. And uh, if I can get through to your hearts, it proves the power of the human touch. And, uh, and it proves the power of truth, too. Truth is, an, is the best healer we have. So be honest with, with all your dealings. And stay honest and stay brave. Blessings on you. Thank you.